welcome everybody. Please put your phones on mute. I'm bringing mine out. Thank you. You're welcome. Please, can you help us there for me? My fault. Thank you. Good evening. Our, to our topic this evening is the testimony of Yeshua. I'd like us to have a word of prayer before we do begin. For those of you that are taking notes, I want to thank you for your patience and I apologize for my. Uh, my shortcoming here. As we do as always, we want to greet everybody with the holy blessings of, your, of our Sabbath. For those of you who are not Seventh-day Adventists, Holy Sabbath, it's a Shabbat day. We'd like to invite you to have a word of prayer with us. And we'd also like to share with you that the topic that will be discussed is the prophecy. The prophecy has been fulfilled. The prophecy has taken place. But we were going to share a little bit of what the book of Song of Solomon has to say and what's occurring, what is coming, which correlates with the study prior to part 89. I hope that you view part 88 so that you can comprehend this one this evening. Let us pray. Let us kneel for those who are able. Holy Sabbath for those that are joining us now. Our Father who art in heaven, Thou were most holy and most glorious, Thou who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. We ask for Your grace and Your mercy that we may pray to Your Son and our Savior and give Him reverence for prayer, for healing, and for supporting us with food and water and employment and supporting this work, this ministry. For we ask for the early and the latter reign of Thy Holy Spirit and the refreshing of the baptism of Your love upon us as we come before you to enter the Sabbath, we claim Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, as we remember the Sabbath to enter your Shabbat, that we may rest from our labors, our employment, and cease from our own personal enjoyment of the night or the day. To give you reverence, I ask for your blessings on my family, our children, my wife, my mother, and my wife's mom and dad and their family, we ask also for your blessings upon those who are mourning for the loss of their life of loved ones. And we ask for your blessings for the Seventh-day Adventist Church of an awakening and preparing for the Second Coming. We ask for your blessings for the Third and Fourth Angels Ministries. And may the meditation of my mind be directed by you. Bless me afresh with thy Holy Spirit. As I speak this evening, Yeshua, we invite you to be with us in this chapel as we enter your Sabbath. And thou may put a sign of eternal life on our foreheads, and that the seal may continue to remain in, upon us, and remain in the book of life, book of remembrance, for thy glory and for thy sake. And Yahshua's people said, Amen. <clears throat> Tonight I'd like to read the, the, some scriptures to us and go to a study. As you know, I believe that summer is nigh. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, the testimony of Yahushua, part 89. In reading, in your hearing, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Yeshua. Worship Elohim, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy, and I'm adding volumes 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are the correct books. That is the message for these last days. As we begin our study, I prepared some information for us. 
And I thought that I'd like to briefly go through some information in regards to what is occurring and what is coming. We know that uh, there is an election and we know that uh, the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, President Ted Wilson, we need to pray for him. We are not perfect. And we also need to pray for ourselves. Can we hear an amen? Time is very short. The testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy, verse 19, verse 10, and that is true. That is correct. Our prophecies have been changed. Books of a new order came in before anybody was ever born. The majority of the church, millions and millions of them, and youth and leaders and pastors don't even know where the messages came from. They were rewritten and our prophecies have been changed. Or may I say, the prophets' prophecies have been changed. <clears throat> Little did the people know that in the last days the original books would be in demand, in high demand. In the 1919 Bible Teachers Conference, that was held just a few years after Ellen G. White had passed away. Haskell had overheard the study and the reading that Ellen White was giving. Through her reading and through her study, he remembered. And Ellen G. White had says that before we meet the objectives of the people, the objectives of the people all over the world, the original books would have to be reprinted in order to meet the objectives of the people. You may find it in the 1919 Bible Teachers Conference. You may read pages 24 and 25. Matter of fact, read the whole book. Very powerful. I'd like to bring before us the testimony of Yeshua. And as I do, I'd like to share with you the true and the counterfeit. There are seven spirits in the sanctuary. And there is a little horn that has risen. And that little horn has been broken. And that little horn wants its, wants its civil power back through Ladato Si. But through much agitation, I'd like to share with us is that it will continue to the second coming. Turn with me to 1 Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Yes, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to read <clears throat> verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. A chief cornerstone is precious. That's Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. That's present tense. Verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Let's do a comparison with Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. And we will read verse 8. Zechariah chapter 7, Zechariah chapter 7, excuse me, Zechari Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9, excuse me. In reading your hearing, For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Yahweh of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity that land of that land in one day. In one day. Now, let's do a comparison with Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. Daniel has 14 chapters. For those of you that are not aware. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. In reading your hearing. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns. These three horns are referring to nationalities that don't exist anymore. The herd of the Vans and the Ostrogoths. We will not be discussing that tonight. I just threw that in. Now, in reading once again, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three horns, of the first horns, puffed up by the roots, 
And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. This is the fifth empire, Papal Rome. They uprooted three nationalities, the Herdad, the Bans, and the Ostagoths. Turn with me to Song of Songs. Let's go to the prophetic book. It's a prophecy with eight chapters. Excuse me. We'll read uh, chapter 5. Song of Songs. Nobody ever refers to that book, and I wonder why. Is the world asleep still in Laodicea? Song of Solomon, chapter 5. I'd like to present verse 12. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 12. Beloved, his eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters washed with milk and fitly set. For we remember when we were at the river, remember when we were captives in Babylon. We remember when we used to do bad things, drugs, alcohol have intercourse with our girlfriends, etc. We, re re we remember when we were bound with Babylon, when we were captive. When we went to the rivers of Babylon and remembered all the things that we did in the past that were bad, that we tend to hide. Me, myself, I don't discuss it because it's filthy. It's bad. There's no joy in remembering what I've done. But there is joy and salvation in remembering what Christ has done for us when he was at the River Jordan, when he was baptized for you. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. Note, God only has perfect vision, seven eyes, seven spirits in the sanctuary. The gift of prophecy is his special love gift to his church, his bride. And they have made an abomination with the spirit of prophecy and rewritten them into five books, which are called Conflict of the Ages. And you better believe there is a conflict of the ages. Our Savior has a controversy with his church. As we go through the testimony of Jesus, we like to share the true and the counterfeit. To your right is the true. There are seven stars. There are seven spirits in the sanctuary. In the world, there is a counterfeit. Out of ten horns, there was one horn left. That little horn rose in 538. Our study on part 88 was to give us an understanding of the past in regards to who were the men and people who were involved in changing the commandments and copycatting everything for Sunday keeping the Lord's Day Alliance and removing all the foundation from Isaiah 58 that is a prophecy for each and every one of us to rebuild back up. First it begins in your mind, in your sanctuary. Then it begins in your family. Then it begins in your community. Then it begins in your churches. Because you are members of churches. And since the churches have forgotten to be the repairs of the breach, our Savior says, i got something for you. And he specifically has got something for Laodicea. Because they're going to hell. My beloved, the crucified and the persecuted one is Yeshua HaMashiach. Turn with me to Song of Songs, chapter 5. Song of Songs, chapter 5. That book's powerful. If you would have known the book, you would have known my Savior, for he speaks of himself through the prophets. As I read, I'd like us to turn to Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 13. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling mirth. You see, 
It is an analogy of the specific words that point to Yeshua. The deer that works through the walks through, through the lilies of the field is Yeshua. He is tender and kind and gentle. We must keep our eyes focused with what's occurring with Israel tonight. They are again being bombarded. They need our prayers. Our Savior has commanded us to pray for Israel. These are Hebrew people. It is the tribe of Judah that is at war with his kissing cousins. They shall smit the judge of Israel upon the cheek. Micah chapter 5 verse 1. Nearly all biblical references to the cheek refer to persecution and mistreatment. However, I'd like us to turn to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. And we will read verse 6. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the smitters, and my cheeks to them that put off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. This prophecy is referring to our Savior, Yeshua, who we hurt. Mark it well and know it well. Because they're going to do the same thing to me and to you. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 3, verse 7. Psalms chapter 3, verse 7. Arise, O Yahweh, save me, O my Elohim, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Verse 8, Salvation belongeth unto the Yahweh, thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. <clears throat> Turn with me to Job, Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16. We have crucified our Savior over and over, over and over, over and over. But it's coming to an end. We have to make a decision on whose side we're going to be on. Job chapter 16 and verse 10. They have gapped upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me upon the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. He's referring to what they did to him at the cross, prior to the cross and after the cross. Let us go to lamentation. Let us... Uh, Go down eternal life. And let us review the prophecies. Bear with me as I find the book, Lamentations. They have spitten me. They have plucked my hair, pulled my beard. They have mistreated me. What have I done unto my people that I should be treated as such? What have they done? As we were viewing people, the Spanish people had asked me what church I belonged to. And I shared with them from the scriptures. And yet, when you give them scripture, they want to know what church you belong to. Well, the question is, what church do you belong to? Because what I do is that I turn them to the Bible. It's kind of unusual, but they, they want to know what church you belong to. And so I give them scripture. And yet my brethren still do not know. But boy, do they ask questions for salvation. Boy, do they ask, do I believe in the Virgin Mary? Yes, but she's asleep. She's dead. We don't pray to her. We don't light candles. We don't put up pictures of Jesus Christ and worship to them, etc. The cross, etc. I told them that's an abomination. That's violating Exodus chapter 20, the second commandment. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 30. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. Yeshua gave both of them. 
Have you given both cheeks recently? Are you able to? It's tough. Turn with me to Micah chapter 5. Micah. I believe it's before Matthew. Yes. Micah chapter 5. Is it Micah? Yeah, it's Micah. We as a people are nearing the end. Much prophecy has been given to our people. And for some reason or another, our people are still weak. They want more and more and more and more. They haven't had enough. They haven't evangelized. They're not evangelizing. The message is, where's the people? Where's the fruit? Turn with me to Micah chapter 5 verse 1. Now, my friends, now gather thyself in troops. O daughter of troops, he hath laid siege against us. They shall smit the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. We need to pray for Israel. Turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 29. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, Offer also the other, and him that taketh away the cloak, thy coat, forbid not to take thy coat also. We got to turn both cheeks. I remember my uncle Peter had shared that with me years, 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 years ago. I really don't got no good news to share about him because he was an abuser. The only person I want to know this evening is about Yeshua. I know that many of you have been mistreated by your uncles, your aunts, your parents, your mommy, your dad. Some of you don't have your parents. You're adopted or you're homeless. But rest assured, our Savior is protecting you. He loves you. He cares. In reading, Christ revealed the spirit of humility, meekness, and submission is what we should be doing as well. To the will of Elohim, as he suffered even the crucifixion, took upon us a death that we deserve, not him. Christ illustrated true meekness, saying that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smit thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Matthew chapter 5 verse 39. Yeshua said, Elohim sent not his son into the world to condemn, in other words, to judge the world. John 3, verse 17. Condemnation and judgment were not to be reckoned with Yeshua. Walked on earth among men. Was a friend among men and was mistreated. They misunderstood his character. As they misunderstand the character of his disciples today. Hamashiach did not take up his work as judge until the judgment was set and the books were opened. The judgment came in 1844, or better yet, the judgment came in October 23rd, 1844, or go back a year, 1843. That's when judgment began. Would you say, or would you agree with me, that's the time of the end? Many of you are kind of confused. But if you read your 1911, it says the judgment of the end began in 1798. But the question is here, is it, did Ellen White write it? No. She didn't write it with the Seventh-day Adventist officials. And when you go through these prophecies with a fine-tooth comb, you get to, you get to realize, wait a minute, there sure is a lot of holes. Of course, because you see, judgment began 1844, October 23rd, the day after. That's the end for them. And the end for us is just down the street. Hamashiach, while upon the earth, although the true judge, 
took no position of judgment or condemnation. In contrast, the Pope, in the year of 538 A.D., when Justinian I gave the power and seat to his bishop, that began the universal system of a Catholic Church. Took the title Corrector of Hirtex. Hirtex. Setting up the courts of the Inquisition, judging and condemning to death all who dare to stand against that papal system. <coughs> this is the history of the past. But my question is today, for all of you who are Seventh-day Adventists and grounded and you got the correct literature, the correct books of Alan G. White and the best Bible you can get, you can have. Are you able to stand right now for him? Are you able to be slapped on both cheeks? I mean slapped. I mean slapped with a bat on both cheeks. Because if you're not, you're not going to give the message. It's that simple. In the year 538 A.D., this Pope took the title Corrector of Hirtex, setting up the courts of the Inquisition, which are many of them, several of them, judging and condemning to death all who dare to stand against that papal system. That period of papal persecution was described by the prophet Daniel, that it made war with the saints, for 1,200 years, no, 1,260 years. Make that very plain. That's Daniel 7, verse 25. And this system took upon themselves the right to disobey the Ten Commandments and to rewrite them and to discipline and to kill all variety of people and to enslave them. Now, the corrector of here text, referring to the persecutor, that began in 538, ended in 1798, there is a total of 260 years for the corrector of here text. The persecuted. From the days of Cain, the wicked have persecuted the righteous. Who shall take upon himself the office to judge his fellow man in matters of the conscience and religion? So here we have the true seven stars, seven spirits, and the counterfeit is that little horn that's rising, been rising. But the question has been asked and been represented. The persecutor from the days of Cain, the wicked, have persecuted the righteous. And it's going to continue until the second coming. And remember what I shared with you in our other study. Bear with me. From the days of Cain, the wicked have persecuted the righteous. Who shall take upon himself the office to judge his fellow man in matters of the conscience and religion, which is the Laudato Si, which is already occurring, it's already come. And the one that I'm looking at here is section 237, Sunday Observance, the Trinity, the Eucharist, worshiping the statute Virgin Mary, etc. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, the sanctuary. And I pray and hope that you understand what is taking place in the sanctuary. And you understand the book of Hebrews in the Old Testament as well as in the Old Testament in the Torah. In Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 2 to 10. In reading your hearing, Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Verse 3, and by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. For sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called Elohim, as was Aaron. So also Hamashiach glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son today, that's present tense, today have I begotten thee, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears, 
unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he dis learned he obedience by the things which he had suffered. Verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Yeshua HaMashiach. Verse 10. Called of Elohim and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. My friends, I know that sometimes things can be hard in Scripture. But there are those that are ridiculing Alan G. White, who was a prophet, messenger, lesser light, who wrote all this information. I was texting my nephew back and forth. He's eager and hungry to know the truth. But the information that he shares with me is we have in the left field. I like you to understand that the Bible comes first. And if the writings of Alan G. White do not correlate with what the scripture is saying, it's not correct. So when he sent me scripture, I shared with him, what version are you reading? If you're reading the 1911, it's corrupt to the core. I said, I'm going to send you a book. And I want you to do the comparisons and do the research that you've been doing. But I want you to check, is it correct? So what that's telling me is that he's not, com he's not completely finished. He accepts and he don't. He, it's because there's holes in there. It's because there's corrupt information that he's gone through, as well as all of you, millions of you all over the world, Seventh-day Adventists. And the book that I'm referring to is actually the great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels comparing the 19th great controversy in 1884. This is a powerful book. Matter of fact, it's the last book that the disciples should be using and memorizing, preparing for the second coming, because it gives us the diameter, I mean, the drama of what's coming and what's occurring and how it's going to finish. But I got news for us tonight. The doctrine that Elohim has committed to the church, the right to control the conscience and to define and punish hearsay, is one of the most deeply rooted of people heirs, and that's what's coming. Persecution's coming. In your great controversy, that was page 293, I want you to check it. Papal heir, referring to the word craft or deceit, enforced by persecution, is described by the prophet Daniel as follows. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 8. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 discusses symbolic terminology. Daniel chapter 8. It is not literal. It is symbolic terminology. Daniel chapter 8, and we will read verse 23 to 25. You reading? Daniel chapter 8, verse 23 to 25. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce conscience... And understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he, shall, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice. And shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Verse 25. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. This has already been fulfilled. Take note. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. I remember I made a note here. The word policy regarding peace talks between the Arabs and Israel. You see, Israel is surrounded with many nations. You got Magog, you got Russia, you got Turkey, you got Persia, okay, Iran, you got the Arabs, you got Egypt. All these countries are going to hit Israel. 
our Savior is going to intercede. The haven for the Hebrews, the Jews, is the coastline down there by Gaza. You can read that prophecy in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4. Matter of fact, Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. When this war breaks loose, the United States is going to turn its back against Israel. You can hear all this political talk going on. It's been going on for the last couple of years, if you haven't been noticing. Today, it's been discussing what they're going to do in order to have peace in the Middle East. They're going to compromise with someone. Now what I will share with you, you need to get your place in the country. You need to get ready for what is occurring, what is coming, because everything is going to close. In reading, papal layer, the word craft that we'll be discussing, or deceit enforced by persecution is described by the prophet Daniel as follows. A king of fierce conscience and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice. That's been occurring. And shall destroy the mighty and holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. His power. Through policy. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, in his mind. Craft shall prosper in his hand. In contrast, in the Song of Songs, in chapter 5, verse 14, it states that the hand of the true Hamashiach is the gold rings. The hands of Christ and Antichrist, the hand of my beloved Christ, dash creator, dash lawgiver, dash nail pierced savior, whose hands were kneel, nailed, the hand of another beloved, lawgiver, persecutor, usurper. His hands are as gold rings set with birdie. Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 14. In reading, turn with me to Zechariah 13, verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are those wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He calls us friends, not enemies, friends. Zechariah 13, verse 6. Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. From his right hand went a fury law. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. Hebrews 10, verse 31. In Luke chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. One mightier whose fan is in his hand. There it is. One mightier whose fan is in his hand who has the power to give us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He is the one that gives it to us. Take note. <clears throat> one mightier whose fan is in his hand will thoroughly purge and will gather the wheat into his, the gar into his garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable until the sins are finished and they're done away with. They will not exist anymore. Now remember when it says forever and ever, it's a period of time that they'll be burning. They're going to experience this horrifying torture. This is sin. All these wicked people are not ever going to exist anymore when the Father says it's done. They've had, he's had enough. Is he wicked? No, he's not wicked. For what they did, they're going to pay for it. My sheep hear my voice. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, And thy ears shall hear a word behind me, behind thee, saying, Walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. He knows you, us, tonight. Can we hear an amen? And they shall follow me, and I gave them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. No one's going to pluck you out of his hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. You hear what he just said? He's got a Father that's greater than all, who is supreme, superior. But he says that he is equal with the Father. 
My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. John 10, verse 27 and 29. Note, the true church, the people, fled into the wilderness for 1,260 years because of the papal persecution, Revelation chapter 12. This persecution in Revelation, or in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, it's going to be revived. It's coming. It has to occur. Christ's hand, which executes judgment, is also the hand outstretched to save his people. His hands are as gold rings, as gold seals. By his nail-pierced hands, in the investigative judgment, his people are sealed into his kingdom. Can we hear an amen? Jerry, you and your family have been called to go into the country and to prepare for the second coming and to prepare a place because people are going to come to your property. And you're going to have to teach them to evangelize. You're going to have to be prepared with missionary work to be able to treat the ill and beloved people. For all the people that are moving into the country, into the mountains, millions of people are going to come to your locations for help and for salvation. But remember that there's a premise and there is a foundation that if they do not keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and obey his Moedims, his health laws, they can't be among us because there is sin in them. And if there is sin found in your home, in your church, in your home church, in your groups, in your families, if there's one little sin, the whole group is gone. Our Savior never knew you. That's Matthew 7, verse 21. I share that with, with love tonight in regards to what is occurring and what is coming and what has occurred in the past. In Isaiah 49, 16, Let's, let's read the whole chapter. Go with me to Isaiah 49. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16. Are you reading? Isaiah 49, verse 16. Here's the key. Behold, I have driven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. You're in his hands, people. Because he says so. No one can pluck you out of his hands. In contrast of Antichrist, it was prophesied he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. Daniel 8, verse 25. The papal power has attempted to usurp, or usurp the position of judge by inquisition and execution. But the true judge, Yeshua HaMashiach, creator, lawgiver, and who is a judge and who is a deliverer, who is a savior, shall act in the investigative judgment for his people as the Yahweh our righteousness. The seal is on your forehead tonight because you are worthy. You have been obedient. You receive the seal on the weekly Shabbat because you're his. We belong to him. He has bled for us. He was nailed to the cross for your sins, our sins. Will you not accept him tonight as your personal Savior? King of kings and Lord of lords. My beloved Hamashiach, King of kings and Lord of lords. Another beloved, a king of fierce conscience. Turn with me to Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 14. His belly is a bright ivory overlaid with sapphire. Sapphire is blue. But I've never seen the real color of sapphire, which is the throne, the foundation of Yahweh in heaven in which he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger and gave it to Moses to give and to show to the people obedience. Because they don't know how to obey. They didn't know how to obey. And today the people still don't know how to obey. Therefore they say, well, we're not under the law, Brother Gonzalez. No, we're not under the Old Covenant. We're under the New Covenant. We're still obeying the law. But when we fall, we have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, that we come before Him and we repent. 
ask for pardon, ask for forgiveness. Gently you have received, gently repent, that you may receive pardon from our own iniquities. Can we hear an amen? His belly is, a, is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphire. Ivory and sapphires are spoken of in scripture in connection with a king's throne. Remember that. Particularly Elohim's throne. Turn with me to <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 26. I saw visions of Elohim, says the prophet Ezekiel, and above the firmament that was over their hands and the, was the likeness of a throne. As the appearance of sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man upon, above, upon it. Turn with me to Exodus 24, verse 10. Exodus chapter 24, and verse 10. Exodus 24, and verse 10. I'm reading. And they saw the Elohim of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. He is revealing to us his throne, his position, his authority, his holiness. I believe that none of us should come short of what this all is referring to. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 18. You may read also Psalms 45, verse 6 through 8, and verse 17. Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 14. Thy throne, O Elohim, is forever. Thy throne is forever. Thy Elohim hath anointed thee above thy fellows out of the ivory palaces. I will make thy name to be remembered forever in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee. Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 14. His belly is a bright ivory. King Solomon's throne of ivory was a type of Christ's throne. 1 Kings, chapter 10, verse 18. Let us remember her Nazarites were pure, whiter, more ruddy. Their polishing was of sapphire. The Nazarites were also a type of Christ as king. Yes, he has plans for all of us. But I believe that we have shamed him. The world has rejected Yeshua HaMashiach has rejected when he was born and why he was born. The establishment of Christ's kingdom. In Psalm of Psalms, chapter 5, verse 15, his legs are as pillars of marble, set upon sockets of fine gold. Two pillars, 40 feet tall, stood before Solomon's temple. 1 Kings, chapter 7, verse 15, 31. Named Jashin, Jashin and Boaz, which by interpretation means, in his strength he shall establish his kingdom. See the marginal reference in your Bibles? Within these hollow pillars was kept the written genealogies of Israel, the names of the people of Elohim. It is in the investigative judgment in his strength that he shall establish his kingdom by making up the true genealogy of Israel, name by name. And the one that's in Israel now is Judah. There's more of them. They have all been scattered. Until it is fully established, the entire history of Elohim's people is reviewed in these judgment scenes. In contrast, another beloved, the Antichrist, has attempted to establish his kingdom upon two pillars or documents of two decretals. These forged documents provide the basis for the establishment of Antichrist upon his throne. They are described as follows. Papal supremacy built on fabrication of decretals. But the 
boldest of Rome's growing claims had their base in the false decretals or the decretals of Persudio, the second of two notorious forgeries, the first, of course, the donation of Constantine. The effect of these forgeries was tremendous in advancing the temporal rulership and ecclesiastical supremacy of the popes. The donation of Constantine forwarding the one and the false decretals the other. The two authorities of Rome will suffice. Before the end of the 8th century, take note please, some apostolical scribes, perhaps the, notor the notorious Isdors, composed the decretals and the donation of Constantine, the two magic pillars of the spiritual and temporal monarch of the popes. Upon these spirit decretals was built the great fabric of papal supremacy over the different national churches a fabric which has stood after its foundation crumbled beneath it. For no one has pretended to deny for the last two centuries that impostors is too palpable for any but the most ignorant or to credit. Excuse me. These purported rescripts or decrees contained everything necessary for the establishment of full spiritual supremacy of the popes. Take note. These decretals supply the popes with the means of establishing the superior jurisdiction of Rome and her authority over the faith of practices, excuse me, and practices of Christendom. And the decretals epistles were declared by this pope to be on an equality with scripture which is a lie. What is coming now is Laudato Si, which is being fabricated throughout the world, and it has been growing and growing and growing. In closing, ecumenism is a distinctive characteristic of the life of the churches. And ecumenicalism is established in Laudato Si, which is a canon law that has been established to control the conscience of society and man. Ecumenism is a distinctive characteristic of the life of the churches in our time in 2024. And the goal is the inclusion of all Christians in a single organic structure under the papacy, or may I say, pharmacy of the Pope. However, the third angel's message is an identification of the papacy as the great beast of Revelation and the Antichrist, the great usurper of Christ's offices and positions in the leadership of his people. In our next study, we will elaborate and we will contrast to the mouth of the true church, of the true Christ, creator and lawgiver. The papal Antichrist is a destroyer and enemy of God's law. The prophecy spoke of him, saying, A little horn, and behold, in this horn were a mouth speaking great things, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and think to change times and laws, Daniel 7, verse 8, and Daniel 7, verse 25. And there was given him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Elohim, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven, Revelation 13, verse 5 and 6. The seventh-day Sabbath is the memorial of the true Hamashiach, creative power. The changing of the law from the seventh day, seventh day Sabbath to the Sunday is an attempt by the Antichrist to deny the creative power of Elohim. This is what the whole war has been about. In reading your hearing, the Christian church at Rome was deeply involved in making this Sunday law, as I shared in part 88. However, historians know now know that Sylvester I, Bishop of Pope, of Rome in 314-335 and Euspis, Bishop of Caesarea from 260-340 were two of the principal church leaders who worked closely with Constantine and influenced him to enact Sunday laws in order to save the nation, their nation, their system, their new world order. 
Now we're in the conclusion of it. This is the last. Later in one of his writings, Eustace mentioned with pride the change in the Bible teaching that he and the church at Rome had empowered the, in causing Constantine's Sunday law to be decreed. We are now transitioning to where La Tato Si is going to be decreed. It is now the time for us to wake up. It is now the time for us to ask, where's the truth? What has happened? Remember that the seventh day Shabbat is the memorial of the true Savior, Father, Omnipotent, Omniscient, Omnipresent. Sunday law to be decreed that occurred then, that's history. But this is the foundation where everything began. Now it's coming back to La Dato Si, section 237. All things whatsoever that were prescribed for the Bible, Sabbath, we have transferred them to the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, as being more authoritative and more highly regarded and first in rank and more honorable than the Jewish Sabbath. Now do you understand what's happened? They copycatted everything of the Shabbat day, Sabbath, and they transferred it all to Sunday occurring on Sunday. When the whole world is being led astray without a shepherd. They're following Satan ignorantly and deliberately and not knowing. Will we not stand and win these souls back to our Savior? These are his jewels. They have to come out of these fallen churches into his remnant. They keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yeshua. Father, as we kneel before you, we thank you for your sure interceding on our behalf. We bring this information out, hopefully that they, they will study, they will review their history, and review if they're grounded in the truth. Bless your people tonight. Sanctify them. Regenerate their spirit with thy Holy Spirit and bless them. For these are your people. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the life you've given to us. Blessed be thy holy name, for we enter your covenant, we enter your Sabbath. Freely you have given, and freely we give. In the name of Yeshua we pray. And Yahshua's people said,